and welcome back to Witch Fix. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about On the Edge of Darkness by Barbara Erskine and it was published in 1998 I believe um, and I'd actually read this prior to the podcast. I think I read this when I was about 12 which was way too young to read this book. Um, my mum had a copy and I think she was very into like historical kind of bodice rippery novels uh, and various other kind of historical thrillers and things and I must have just had this one on her recommendation I think she recommended it to me because it has some witchy content and she thought I would like that and because I'd never really had my reading um censored in any way um they like my parents never really said oh no you can't read that book it's too old for you or whatever I just picked whatever I wanted and, and read it and I think to be honest the reason I'm saying I think I was too young for this is because it's a little bit complicated and also a little bit dark in places and quite um, ambiguous in terms of a lot of the events that take place in it and kind of who you're meant to root for and I think that would have been quite difficult to mentally sort out when I was 12 um, but I recently found it in a buy three books four books for a pound uh, bin outside of Oxfam, so I thought, aha, I, it is time for me to revisit this one. Now, I remember having two very different opinions about this book when I first read it, when I was a teenager. One, that it was quite good, and I enjoyed bits of it, that it was quite creepy and scary, and then also that it made me incredibly angry, and I wasn't sure why, I couldn't remember why, and I didn't realise why until I finished it earlier today, because... Let's just start off with the obvious here, shall we? There should be a certain length for a book to be that a book can be before you can end it with, oh, and it was all just a dream. That length probably should be no pages, but it definitely shouldn't be 484 cocking pages. I mean, just to have like three paragraphs at the end to say, oh, but it was all just a dream and none of it actually happened. And then you read the author's note and then you rip the book in half with your bare strength and then you just throw fistfuls of pages into the air and scream because that's frustrating as fuck living aside the rather massive point that yes that is how the book ends um i'm going to tell you a little bit about what the book's actually about and i'm also going to give trigger warnings for quite a lot of things there's a lot of like relationship abuse sexual abuse potentially i think rape is mentioned and, and certainly maybe depicted at some points um there's definitely a lot of dubious consent flying around throughout the book and there is sex between people who are underage but they are both underage so there you go now, the actual plot of the book is that in Scotland, in a time that is not the 90s, I feel like it was the 1950s, but I can't remember, and I don't want to look back and find out, but yeah. So there's a kid called Adam, he's 14, and his mum leaves his dad, his dad's quite a, a severe preacher in the Scottish Highlands, and Adam flees onto the moors, or the wilderness, or whatever you want to call it, um, to be alone with his misery and he goes to sit by a Celtic stone cross which he's gone to sit out before because it's like his place where he goes to brood except that cross kind of functions like a bridge between worlds and he ends up meeting uh, a young girl called Breed who is um, Pictish I think uh, or vaguely Celtic in origin um, and she is of his age and they become friends and then later on they become more than friends and become lovers and then she goes off to study at basically druid college um to become a, a druid and to learn all about like magic powers and things which she possesses some of and that would all be fine and dandy if adam didn't then go off to medical school in edinburgh and if Bree didn't then betray her family and her like druid elders by deciding that she very much wanted to come and live in the modern world with him to be together and at that point Adam's kind of had a bit of time to cool off from this quite weird and possessive strange girl he's met on the moors and he wants to move on with his life and meet new people from his time as you do and so what follows is about 400 pages of breed kind of hunting Adam throughout his life and taking out her anger and jealousy on the women in his life and basically anyone who gets near him. The issues I had with that 
to, sort of to begin with is that Adam never really seems to care about Breed at all. He's always kind of vaguely frightened of her and comes across as just kind of humouring her because she lets him have sex with her and that's basically all he's there for and then when she gets a bit too clingy a bit too much more trouble than she's worth uh, he just kind of kicks her to the curb and says oh well I'm going to Edinburgh so we won't be able to be friends anymore um and to be honest Adam as a main character which he is the main character of the novel uh, although it shifts perspective between several different characters he isn't very sympathetic he basically treats all the women in his life kind of like garbage particularly the the poor woman he ends up marrying he just kind of makes her life a living hell and then she dies so that's that's lovely so he's he doesn't come across as an incredibly sympathetic character and it's quite hard to care about him uh, i actually ended up feeling a little bit sorry for breed because she ends up having like nowhere to go she's like destroyed the life that she had in her own time because she didn't want to live by the rules that she was forced to live under as a druid in training and now the only way that she can cling to her life in adam's world in like the present day at that point um is to be with him and he very much does not want to be with her except for the periods where he does want to be with her and then he ends up blaming her for all the bad things that he does because he's so obsessed with her and it's just very strange and not particularly sympathetic for him the book is broken up into four separate parts so the first part is adam's viewpoint um part two is jane uh, jane is the lady who becomes his wife it does skip around perspective in those you're not actually in like jane's perspective for all of jane's part of the book but i guess it sort of more heavily relates to them and their perspective is a little bit more hefty in that sense um the third part is lisa or liza i guess um that is his first girlfriend after he moves to edinburgh who sort of becomes like a lifelong friend slash um one-time lover type friend like first love um so she features then in part three and then the final part is beth which is adam's granddaughter now so aside from the slightly unsympathetic main character one of the major issues i have with the book is that it kind of reads like it was written by a man and i did check this to make sure that i wasn't like forgetting that barbara erskine is the pen name of a dude but turns out it's not or if it is no one knows about it yet but when uh, i was doing my uh, degree course we were given extracts as part of an exercise and we were asked, you know, did a woman write this or did a man write this? And nine times out of ten, you can spot what a man has written and what a woman has written. And there are various different nuances and things that you, sometimes I don't think you can quite put your finger on, but you can kind of see when you're reading the text, oh, yeah, a man wrote this or a woman wrote this. And it might not be even anything that they're saying or any of the viewpoints they're expressing. It's just the way in which they use imagery and the way they put themselves across in the text. And this comes off as if it was written by a man. The main reason that I think that it kind of reads that way is the way in which it describes women. Like every time a, a woman is described like who we've met before, but there have been like a, a gap in time. It's like, oh, Lisa put on her coat and then looked in the mirror and secretly thought, oh, how well I'm doing to have such a trim waist at my age and my hair not showing a strand of grey. And those aren't really the ways that female characters are described when female writers are writing them they tend to be like less concerned with things about that and more concerned with like emotion to take this back to some advice that i got when i was doing gcse english um, our teacher said basically when asked to write a story boys will write about stuff happening girls will write about how they feel about stuff happening i'm not saying that's 100 percent true and i'm not saying it applies in every instance but this definitely felt like kind of a wish fulfillment fantasy that a man would write um especially at the beginning it's really obvious because adam meets breed and she speaks like gaelic or what he thinks is gaelic uh, but definitely not the same language he's speaking and so he's trying to like teach her english and she's only interested in getting chocolate cake from him and he's like trying to teach her how to say things and she's kind of comes across as being a bit stupid and a bit like kind of like a neanderthal really uh, it reminded me a bit of stig of the dump which if you haven't read it is about a, a modern boy who meets a caveman who's somehow managed to like travel in time and they become friends 
it was kind of like that like she comes off as being more juvenile than him and he's very serious and he's already studying books about botany because he wants to be a doctor and he's very mentally higher up than she is even though she's meant to be trained to be a druid and she's trained to be a bard and all of these things and it does feel very much like she's being kind of talked down to another thing that kind of made me feel like it was written in more of a male fantasy kind of way is the fact that basically every woman in the book is either the madonna or the whore because you've got breed who's very like sexual she's mostly naked whenever she shows up to be honest you just can't seem to keep clothes on her um and she's bad because she lures adam away with sex and things whereas his wife is described as wearing like a broderay uh anglaise white nightdress and she was saving herself for her previous boyfriend who like died in the war because he was an RAF pilot um and it's all very like virginy and it's, oh, it's just very strange and I, I can't really put that down to when it was written because I mean this was written like it came out at the tail end of the 90s but it feels like it was written sometime in the 70s it's very um old-fashioned in a lot of ways something else that rather annoyed me throughout is I think it takes until like page 470 for Adam to, as an old man, say, oh, I think Breed is like a time travelling Celtic person. For the rest of the book, he describes her as like a murderous tinker or um, what most commonly throughout the book, she's referred to as like a murderous tricksome gypsy, which is incredibly racist. Um, and it's on the one hand yes that is incredibly racist and it also bothers me on the other hand because it's inaccurate and it's stupid of him to even entertain that as being an explanation for her like at various points in the book she turns into a cat he has known her for like 70 years and yet she has not aged beyond the point of being 21 she can appear and disappear in various different places and does various other magic things and he's still like oh yeah she was just this tinker's daughter who i met in scotland who's stalking me ho 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 it's like no she's like an insane witch from like a pre-christian era you dense fuck getting quite annoyed with it <laughs> various points obviously the focus of much of the witchy content is the character of breed herself uh, she does quite a lot of magical stuff. Uh, I've mentioned already that she shapeshifts into a cat and she can sort of transport herself over large distances just using the power of her own mind. Obviously, there's also the time travelling thing, which is poorly explained at best. Um, at the beginning of the book, it's kind of implied that if you walk past the stone and you kind of have a mind that's open in the correct way you can walk into a different time but then later on people are just time traveling all over the bloody shop they're not even near the stone she can just go back and forth whenever she wants and it's not really explained how that works or why it's not very clearly anyway so that was a little bit annoying but her other powers include the fact that she can kind of go into like a comatose state and kind of spirit journey around and also that she knows things about like plants and things like that like at one point she comes out of a coma and she's like dying of starvation so she like digs around and makes herself a little soup and she's like surviving she's got like quite a lot of skills in that area but she doesn't really do much in the way of like actual ritual magic ironically it's the other characters in the book who kind of do that instead um, various amulets and talismans are made at certain points throughout the novel to keep Breed at bay and to protect different people in Adam's life there's one moment where Lisa has been told to go and get um, sticks of rowan and tie them with red thread to make a cross which is quite nice to like make a protection amulet and then in the latter stages of the book like in the last 50 pages it's revealed that Adam spent like the latter part of his life researching uh, witchcraft and demonology and black magic and things like that to try and find a way to summon breed back so that he could talk to her because she'd like been absent for quite a long time one of the focal characters who isn't breed who has magic is a guy called merin who is a welsh neighbor of lisa's um in wales and he lives in a little hut at well not a hut but like a little cottage and he knows stuff about magic and things like that and he's kind of like 
I guess, a sort of modern equivalent of a druid. His character kind of annoyed me because he kind of appears and disappears as needed in a deus ex machina, Gandalfy type way. And there's a point at the beginning where he makes this like amulet, which is a silver tree with a special crystal in it, which is meant to protect um, Adam and Jane, his new wife, from Breed's presence. But then he only makes one of them, even though he knows that Breed is after uh, after Lisa as well. And then later on, he's the one who tells her to make the Rowan cross. But again, he only tells her to make one. And it's like, well, why don't you make more than one? And then you can just, like, protect everyone, you divot. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a spoiler because it's describing events later on in the book. But at one point after Adam has become married, Bree does appear again. And he kind of starts having an affair with her in the sense that he goes to work. And when he comes home, he goes straight upstairs, ignoring his wife. And Bree will appear in the bedroom and they will just, like, have sex until he passes out and then he gets up and goes to work the next day again completely ignoring his wife and but when she goes in there when he's not there Breed isn't in the room she just appears when Adam's home and it's kind of stated that Breed is kind of using him uh, like kind of like a psychic vampire in a way to keep herself in this plane of existence so that she doesn't go back to where people are trying to kill her in ye olde Celtic times but this goes on for like literally 10 years or like like a ridiculous amount of time and at no point does Merrin step in and offer a solution to this he just kind of disappears because I guess the plot didn't need him to be around and no one at any point tries to do like a real kind of intervention on Adam they go around to the house like at various points it's like a scene that gets repeated a few times Lisa comes down from Wales and she comes down to St Albans to talk to Adam and be like you can't treat your wife this way and he's like oh just leave Lisa I don't need you here and then he goes upstairs and gets all naked with Breed um but no one at any point ever just like manhandles him into a van and like drives him somewhere far away to be deprogrammed or like manhandles into into a van and then does like an exorcism or anything to like get rid of her presence they just kind of let it happen they just stand around and effectually going you shouldn't be doing this and then he continues to be doing this and this goes on for like quite a while and no one's done anything to stop it and then suddenly at one point Jane kind of sits him down and is like oh it would be really nice if we could go away and uh you know have a holiday and stuff and he's like oh well, that'd be really nice I would like to get her to go away and Jane is surprised and is like oh how long have you felt like that and he's like oh I don't know a while and you're just like well you could have told someone you idiot and then straight away like that completely falls to pieces and a lot of bad shit happens because he's just an ineffectual divot so I guess what I'm saying is my main problem with the book is that a lot of things like you can see the plot working behind the characters and sometimes the plot doesn't let them react or act like normal people would in any given situation they just kind of like oh yes doing this would make sense but I can't do it because plot reasons that's why don't examine it too closely now even though I have said a lot of negative things about this book and there are quite a lot of negative things to say about it I think it is quite unique and interesting in that it's sort of a gothic style thriller type thing. It kind of gave me Wuthering Heights vibes, um, but obviously a lot more modern. And it does quite a good job at being like a horror story in places. It's just where it gets bogged down in the kitchen sink drama side of it that it kind of falls apart. And I could have done with it being half the length and maybe a bit more focus on Breed's character. And then it not ending with everything having been a dream. Because why would you even do that? That's like so basic. Uh, so if you, um, if you get this book, my advice would be to turn right to the end and then rip out chapter 24. Uh, which is literally just a page or half a page and then throw it away because it makes no sense. Having said that, the actual whole ending of the book doesn't make a huge amount of sense. It's quite gets into kind of being a rollicking good story and you're like, oh cool, this is fun. We're going to go all like gothic and weird and lots of murders are happening and oh, it's really cool. And then it just kind of stalls and peters out and then only the non-interesting characters are alive um, doing non-interesting things that just 
basically just getting in cars and going up and down mountains and running around in storms with torches, not getting a whole lot of anything done. And then the book ends and nothing has been really properly explained. It's sort of like maybe there was no ending envisaged when the book started, but I would say generally speaking, like the last eighth of the book is just kind of rubbish that you have to get through. But well, at least the, the preceding seven eighths had some interesting ideas and concepts and some pretty gripping scenes, even if they aren't um, written in a way that makes you feel sympathetic to any of the characters. This is coming off like I don't recommend this book, and to be honest, I kind of don't, but I also kind of do because it's at least something different and a bit interesting, and it's tried to do something that isn't just your normal romance novel or normal kind of time travel romance novel. Uh, and Barbara Erskine is quite a popular author, although popular with like people my mum's age. So I guess this makes it more one of the more mainstream titles that I've looked at on the podcast. But if you do end up tracking down a copy of On the Edge of Darkness by Barbara Erskine, do let me know what you thought of it. Let me know how you felt when you got to chapter 24, if you didn't take my advice and rip that shit out before you started. And you can do so in the normal way, which is Twitter, which is at Witchfix, and email, which is witchfixpodcast at gmail.com. In the meantime, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye!